This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Regular tic-tac-toe can get a bit boring. If both players are playing optimally, it always ends in a draw. But what happens if you increase the width of the board? Or increase the dimension of the board? Or increase both? Tic-tac-toe is a classic game. Two players, X and O, take alternating turns drawing their respective symbols on one square of a 3x3 board. The first player to get three in a row, either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally, wins. For the sake of convention, we'll say that X always goes first. If both players are playing optimally, meaning that they always make the best possible move, then tic-tac-toe will always end in a tie. It will always be a draw. The only way to win tic-tac-toe is if your opponent messes up. Basically, the standard game of tic-tac-toe is too easy. How can we, as mathematicians, play with the combinatorics of tic-tac-toe? There are at least three easy ways to modify the game of tic-tac-toe. Increase the width of the board, like this 5x5 board. Increase the dimension of the board, like this 3x3x3 board. Or increase both, like this 4x4x4 board. We'll examine tic-tac-toe with different widths and dimensions and ask, is the game a draw or can one of the players force a win? We'll always be assuming the players are playing optimally. They have unlimited computational powers to determine the best possible move on each turn. In all the different sized tic-tac-toe boards we'll examine, the second player can never win. The game will either be a draw or the first player will have a winning strategy. Essentially, this is because the first player could always steal the strategy of the second player. Now, let's start modifying the tic-tac-toe board by increasing the width. On this 4x4 board, a player wins by creating a horizontal, vertical, or diagonal line of length 4. Similarly, on this 5x5 board, the winning line will have length 5. Before we dive into the strategy of 5x5 tic-tac-toe, you might want to pause here and play a few games. 5x5 tic-tac-toe is a draw. Under optimal play, there's no way for either player to force a win. Let's prove that. We already know that O, the second player, can't win any variant of tic-tac-toe. So we only have to prove that X, the first player, can't force a win on the 5x5 board. Basically, we want to show that no matter where X moves, there is still space for O to block. So if X moves here and O immediately blocks their diagonal, then we need a strategy that ensures O will block the row and column later, if X becomes closer to filling them. For this, we'll use a pairing strategy given by this diagram. Notice that any winning line, so a vertical, horizontal, or diagonal line, contains two squares with line segments going in the same direction as the line, like this or this. Let's say that X moves here. Well, then O should move on that square's pair the one that contains the continuation of the line segment. That way, O has effectively blocked X from winning along that row. If X moves here, then O moves here, blocking the diagonal. By continuing that pattern, they'll be able to block X from ever completing a row, column, or diagonal. If X moves in the center, then O can just move anywhere. They don't need to block that move. No matter what X does, the game always ends in a draw. Actually, for any n greater than 2, an n by n game of tic-tac-toe is provably a draw. That is, you can prove that if both players are playing optimally, the game will always end in a draw. Basically, two-dimensional tic-tac-toe is a little boring. So let's bump up the dimension of the board. Here's a 3 by 3 by 3 tic-tac-toe board. It has width 3 and dimension 3. If you've never played 3 by 3 by 3 tic-tac-toe, pause here and give it a try. As long as X, the first player, goes in the middle, then they'll win. Essentially, that's because there's so many lines, 13 to be exact, that go through the middle of a 3x3x3 tic-tac-toe board. That square is just incredibly easy to win from. Actually, even more amazingly, it's impossible to tie in 3x3x3 tic-tac-toe. And your challenge problem for the week is to prove that. Using a big stretch of the imagination, you can even play a 3x3x3x3 game with 3 dimension 4. You just draw three copies of three-dimensional tic-tac-toe. But what does a winning line look like on a four-dimensional board? 
Let's start by making very explicit what the winning lines look like on the two-dimensional board. We'll give each square a pair of numbers, its row and column, like this. Here's an example of a winning row. The first coordinates, the row, are the same, and the second coordinates are all different. They increase from one to five. The exact opposite holds for this winning column. In this winning diagonal, the first coordinates are all different in decreasing order, and the second coordinates are all different in increasing order. That's what makes a line. For each coordinate, either all the numbers are the same or all the numbers are different, counting in increasing or decreasing order. For example, these five boxes are not a line because the second coordinate is the same for two but different for the others. And these five boxes are not a line because the second coordinate is not in increasing or decreasing order. So in general, if you're playing tic-tac-toe on a board of width W and dimension D, then each square is labeled with D coordinates, which are numbers between one and W. Then any set of W boxes makes a line if each coordinate is the same for every box, like this, or different for every box and strictly increasing, like this, or strictly decreasing, like this. If there's even just one coordinate where some boxes agree and others disagree, like this, then it's not a line. You should check that this definition aligns with your intuition about the three-dimensional board. Let's review what we know using this handy chart. The horizontal axis is the width of the tic-tac-toe board, and the vertical axis is the dimension. So for example, this square corresponds to the standard width three dimension two board. Within each square, we'll note whether X wins or the game is a draw under optimal play. Well, regular two dimensional tic-tac-toe is a draw for the standard three by three board and any wider board. You can also play 2D tic-tac-toe on a two by two or even one by one board, but they're pretty boring. X always wins. We also explored what happens if you increase the dimension of a width three board and found that X wins. Well, this is the rest of the chart. The question marks indicate that the result was shown through computer simulations, but has not been rigorously proven. What patterns do you notice? The chart highlights a tension in higher dimensional tic-tac-toe. As we increase the width, which corresponds to moving right along a row, it leaves more space in each line for O to block X, but doesn't add very many lines for X to win along. Intuitively, that makes it easier for O to force a draw. In other words, if dimension D width W is a draw, then dimension D width W plus one is a draw. But as we increase the dimension, which corresponds to moving down a column, it creates many more lines. Higher dimensions have more directions for winning lines to go in. Intuitively, that makes it easier for X to force a win. In other words, if dimension D width W is a win for X, then dimension D plus one with W is a win for X. Those two statements are actually conjectures. No one has ever proved them, but they seem very plausible. Now, let's focus on one specific column. For example, in this one, we're fixing the width of the board at four, but we're increasing the dimension. The Hales-Jewett theorem says that as we look down the column, it will eventually become all wins for X. More specifically, it says that for a fixed width W, there is some dimension D such that the width W dimension D and above games cannot end in a draw. And this means that X must have a winning strategy. So each column of the chart, except the first, begins with a draw. And the Hales-Jewett theorem says that it eventually becomes all wins for X. But we don't know what happens in between. We don't know whether it suddenly switches to win or if there are oscillations, win, lose, win, lose. Here's the big open question suggested by the chart. If we fix a width W, which means that we're focusing on one column, it appears that there exists some dimension D of W such that it's a draw in dimensions smaller than D of W and a win for X in dimensions D of W and above. In other words, D of W is the magic cutoff when a board of width W switches from being a draw to a win. For example, D of four is three, meaning that for a board of width four, it's a draw in dimensions below three and a win for X in dimensions three and above. 
The chart shows evidence of these magic cutoffs for boards of width 1 through 10. But no one has been able to rigorously prove the value of these magic cutoffs, or even that they exist at all. The chart is really infinitely wide and infinitely long, and despite the simplicity of tic-tac-toe, huge portions of the chart are a big mathematical mystery. See you next time on Infinite Series. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. I like the A Curious World series, which offers bite-sized previews of the scientific and engineering wonders that surround us. Get unlimited access today, and for our audience, the first two months are free if you sign up at curiositystream.com infinite and use the promo code infinite during the sign-up process. First off, last week's Axiom of Choice video was a re-upload. There was a mistake in the set of rationals you used to shift S, which we fixed. Thanks for your patience. In the comments, Luca Nalan mentioned that you can also use the axiom of choice to give an incredible solution to a classic problem about infinite prisoners. There's a great Mathologer video on it, which we'll link to in the description. Sunshineo23 said, After learning about the negative 1 12th thing, I no longer believe that adding a small number to itself infinitely many times results in infinity. Why can't the result be 2? Good question. First off, the idea that the sum of the natural numbers is negative 1 12th is a highly non-standard way of adding numbers. Typically, one says that the sum diverges to infinity. Let's use the standard method to add a tiny number, like 1 1,000th, to itself infinitely many times. Well, after adding it to itself 1,000 times, you get 1. After adding it to itself 10,000 times, you get 10. The result just keeps getting bigger and bigger and is unbounded. The tinier the number, the longer it takes to get big, but it will eventually get arbitrarily large. In fact, the only way to add infinitely many numbers together and get a finite number is if the numbers are getting smaller and smaller, like 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth, and so on. Finally, our challenge winner is For Your Math, who proved that the SI and SJ are disjoint and that the union of all the SI contains the interval 0 to 1. Check out their comment for details. Nice job.